Welcome, I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 3, or 13 rather, Matthew chapter 13. Uh, we've been dealing on these Saturday uh, nights with the parable of the sower. Uh, we're continuing in that, and I want to read again that parable. And one of the striking things about that parable and about all of the parables, I guess, is the simplicity of it. Um, it is something that everybody can understand. And it's interesting, the parables like, for instance, the parable of the uh, prodigal son. You can go any place in the world and preach that thing. <laughs> and everybody knows exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> so there's nothing confusing about the parables. And in this particular parable, one of the impressive things is that Jesus himself gives the explanation of uh, what the thing means. So there's no wiggle room. You can't, uh, you can't adjust it. He himself gives you the focus of what it's all about. So when you look at uh, Matthew chapter 13, he begins in uh, verse 3 with these words. Then he spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up, because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up and choked them, but others fell on good ground and yielded a crop, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to hear. And we make a decision tonight. To open our lives, we have a choice in this. This is not, well, I can't help myself. This is, you have given us a free will. We can choose, and we choose to listen to you. And we're not asking it to be easy. We're not asking it to be comfortable. We're not asking you to pat us on the back. We're not asking you to make us feel good. We're not asking for blessing. We're asking for your truth to be tailor-made for our individual life and for you to do in me, I'm asking for you to do in me what you need to do. Whatever is in me that you don't want, I want you to take it out. Whatever's not in me that you want to have in me, please bring it to me. Whatever I need in the expansion of Jesus in the totality of my life, in expression of his heart, in the embrace of his person, in the wisdom of of his thinking, whatever I need in any of those areas, I pray for that to take place in my life tonight. And I would pray that for all of us as well. So we're sitting at your feet tonight. Uh, would you speak to us? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. We discovered that in the explanation that Jesus gives concerning this, this parable, uh, that he gives no explanation for the sower. So the sower is not the main focus. We understand that. And we understand from other parables that the sower is Jesus. So that's in place. We also discovered that the seed, he gives very little explanation of the seed. The only thing he has to say about the seed is in verse 19, and that is that it's the word of the kingdom. And we have discovered, of course, that the kingdom is a very special idea in the scriptures, that the kingdom is not a king ruling over territory, that the kingdom is a relationship, and that this person called Jesus I have my helplessness, I am empty, I have no ability, I can't pull it off, I can't live life like I ought to. He comes in his overwhelming presence and person and fills me. And in that combination, I become the kingdom. So he's not the kingdom, I'm not the kingdom, we are the kingdom. So this is a merger of your life and Jesus. So Jesus wants to merge with you. He is not a mystical feeling, he is not a... Uh, he is not a, an idea to embrace. He's not a theology to understand. He is an intimate relationship to experience. And he wants to move within your life. You need that. You can have that. I want that. I can have that. That's what he's proposing to us. So that's the seed that's going to be planted. It's the word, the truth, the reality of that idea, of that thing, of Jesus and you coming together in that intimacy. That's what he wants for your life. That's the seed that's being planted within you. And if you want proof for that, I suppose nobody could really prove it, but 
uh, some of the evidence of that is the fact that you and I crave. We have longings. And we try to satisfy those longings. Nobody seems to be satisfied. We want to be better. We have a longing because he's planted that within us. He's pulling us to himself, which is phenomenal. We've been dealing then with the soil. And obviously, the whole idea of the parable are the soil, or is the soil. And he gives us four kinds of soils. Now, the language of this, I've discovered, has been wrong in my life. And I want to propose this to you tonight. And hey, I don't know how this will go over, what you'll think of this. And wow, I'm just wrestling with this idea. All my life, I have thought in relationship to this parable. And that's a long time. So all my life, I have wrestled with the idea that the soil is who you are, who I am. And that Jesus is planting the seed in the soil of my life. And that my life is to respond. So the soil is who I am. That's what I've always thought. Now I'm in studying this anew and afresh and getting into this a little deeper. I'm beginning to understand that I don't think that's quite right. That the arena that he's talking about, it is right. He is planting the seed in your life my life no question about that but he's planning it not just in your life in general not just all over your life not just well in your emotions not just well in your spiritual life not just in your mind he's not just revealing ideas to you he's not that's not the seed where that's not where the seed is being planted the seed is being planted in a specific area of your life And I'm not a psychiatrist, so I don't, psychologist, so I don't know how all of this fleshes out. But in the parable, as you walk through it, it's always in the arena of the area of your life that does the responding. In fact, as you look at the parable in his explanation, It's stuff like this that you read. For instance, in verse 19, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, then at the end of that he says, this is he who received seed by the wayside. But he who receives, see, all of that's responding language, receiving and responding to it. He who received the seed on stony places is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy in other words responds to it so the whole arena is your respond area now that shouldn't be hard for you because you respond to all kinds of things I slap you upside the head you respond what is that area that has that response what is it in you that responds what is it within you that makes a decision hey you hit me I'm hitting you back Whatever that is, that's where this seed is planted. It's planted within the arena, within the area of your life where the response takes place. And your response, my response, is determined by choice. I choose. Again, you come up, hit me in the mouth, I double up my fist, hit you back. And then you look at me and say, well, why did you hit me? And I say, well, I didn't. It was my hand. And you don't buy that at all. See, you just don't buy that. Because you know that the hand is under the control of something else, and there is a will involved, and there is a response that's going on, and I chose, and the choice came out of the response area. Now, I don't know what you call that area, but that's the area he's talking about. And I'm proposing to you tonight that he is planting the seed, not just in your life in general, but he's planting the seed in the area in which you are capable of response. And the response will come from a definite, distinct choice that you make. So, wow, isn't this exciting? You can choose to respond tonight. In fact, you and I will make a choice. Oh, you shouldn't have come to this service. Because we will 
respond will be we will be one of these soils in response tonight now last week we looked at the idea of attitude because it appears throughout the parable that as he lists these 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 soils and the response of these soils and we've named them of course hard-hearted hannah which is the wayside shallow holly holly shallow hollow holly which is, of course, the shallow, the stony places. And then there's Fickle Freckled Frederick, which is the freckled, freckled, freckled guy who's just kind of wishy-washy, cares of the world, have overcome him. And then there's the available, uh, acceptable, uh, accepting uh, Andrew, who is the good soil. So every one of these responses, every one of these soils has a response, and in the framework of that response, is an attitude and it's the attitude that seems to determine the response and the attitude that determines the response is a long-term deal going on in your life and we talked about that last week what I want to talk to you about tonight is another arena of that or another aspect of that and that is the attachments it's really intriguing to me then in every one of these soils, I guess except the last one, there is attachments. What I mean is that there are things that determine the response that are all tied into the response that are additions to, that are added on, that are attached to life. And it's those attachments that have reached out, grabbed a hold of my decision maker, and have literally brought me to the place where I choose the way I do therefore it's to satisfy these attachments that I make this choice for instance in the uh, in the stony places the, there's an attachment it's the stone it's the stony places that are bringing this soil into a response that is going to be negative uh, for instance in the fickle freckled Frederick there's this there's this cares of the world the attachments of the world that are coming up uh, coming within to the individual which are forming and shaping the way he's responding to the seed of the word of the kingdom that's coming to his life so there's these attachments and I want to talk to you about those kind of attachments uh, start for instance with verse 19 it, of course, is the description that Jesus gives concerning the, uh, the hard-hearted Hannah, the, the, the wayside soil. And here's what he says. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it. Well, again, we talked a little bit about that last week, but hey, we need to go through that again because it really applies to what we're trying to say tonight. The word understand is very significant because the word understand is literally two word, Greek words put together or at least a prefect and a root word and that is the word together is one idea of the word together with or together and the other part of the word is to place or to put or to send. So it's the idea of like a puzzle. You got all these pieces here. You're putting all these pieces together and when you get it all together, ah, oh, there's the whole picture. So, He's talking about you don't understand, meaning that you've got these pieces that are coming at you and you're reaching out, taking these pieces and you can't fit them together. They don't, you don't under, it doesn't, it doesn't form a picture and you don't get the overall. I just don't understand this, meaning I just can't put all of this together. So he says that's the soil that we're dealing with. The soil just can't quite understand. Well, why can't he understand? Well, because he hasn't had any biblical training. He doesn't bring that up. Well, he wasn't raised in the church. He doesn't bring that up. Well, he has never, uh, he has, he has, he, he has never been taught. Well, the pastor doesn't explain it well enough. He doesn't bring that up. Thank you, Jesus. So he never brings that up. See, none of that is brought up. Doesn't have anything to do with that at all. It has to do with what's going on down inside the response mechanism, the response area of this particular soil. And this particular soil has decided that he is not going to respond. It is a matter of choice. Jesus ran into this 
all the time. Um, the students, we've been walking through Matthew chapter 16. Jesus comes along and says, uh, I've got six months left in my ministry. And uh, guys, I want to get you ready for what's going to happen. Well, what's going to happen? And he gives his first prediction of his death and resurrection. And they went crazy. What? You're going to die and be raised from the dead? No, you're not. Why? You're the Messiah. And Messiahs don't die. Come on. They do magic tricks. Fire comes out of their mouth and burns people up. I mean, come on. Messiahs don't. Messiahs call down legions, from, from, legions of angels from above and smash everybody. Ma Messiahs, no. Messiahs don't bleed, suffer, and die. And they just could not make sense of it. It didn't make any sense to them at all. Let me ask you. Does that whole thing of bleed, suffer, and die give your life up? You know what Jesus said to them? He turned to them. Think of this. He turned to them. Think of how crazy this is. He turned to them and said stuff like, if you want to be my disciple, deny yourself, take up your cross, follow me. That's crazy, people. He went on to say stuff like, let me explain that to you, Sid. And he went on to say things like this. If you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. If you seek to lose your life for my sake, you'll find it. <laughs> That's the silliest thing I ever heard in my life. If you save your life, you'll lose it. If you lose your life, you'll save it. See, that doesn't compute. All my life, people, what I've heard is grab for yourself, get for yourself, Kick the other guy before he gets up. Do unto others before they do to you. If you want to be successful, you got to cut some corners. See, all my life I've heard that. Hey, you got to defend, you got to protect, you got to guard. Lock your doors. Don't let anybody in. Build walls, protect, guard. Heard that all my life. How are you going to be successful? You got to crawl, fight, scrape your way up. You got to. Jesus comes along and says, eh. it doesn't compute. It doesn't make any sense. Have you read the Sermon on the Mount? Turn the other cheek. <laughs> now, come on. Who believes that? Even those who have, of us who believe it give a token to it only. Yeah, usually you turn the other cheek. Yeah, maybe once or twice, then beat the living daylights out of me. Because it doesn't compute. Why doesn't it compute? Because there is this attachment to my life. And the attachment in the pathway is so strong that it does not, it will not allow truth to make sense to me. And one of the things Jesus is attempting to do in my life, in your life, is to break through that attachment. Well, what is that attachment? Oh, come on. That attachment is good old-fashioned self-centeredness. See, I'm so wrapped up in myself that to give myself away doesn't make any sense. 
because I love myself. See, I'm so stuck on myself that if you take advantage of me, it irritates me. And the attachment of the soil that has become so hard that the kingdom message just... But you have a choice tonight. You could lose your life. And you might say, well, prove to me that if you seek to save your life, you'll lose it. Are you happy with where you are? All your life you've been seeking to save your life. How's it working out? (laughs) Come on, the proof is everywhere. See, we've tried everything but losing our lives. What would happen if you would genuinely, 100%, absolutely down to it, lose your life? I mean, give yourself up. I mean, hey, no agenda, just, just, and turn your entire life over to somebody bigger than you are who's got a plan for you. Well, how would that work out? I don't know. What would he have me do? I have no clue. You don't either. Why? Because he hasn't told you. So he isn't going to lay it out? Come on. You've got to risk something here. You want in on this? The word of the kingdom will grow in you and produce 60, 100 fold. But only in the response. I'm ready to do that. I want to do that. Uh, Shallow, hollow, holly. Interesting. Listen to the attachments. Verse 20, Jesus gives the explanation. But he who received the seed on stony places, that is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he has no root in himself but endures only for a while. For when temptation or persecution arises because of the word, immediately He stumbles. Now, I picture Shallow Holly Holly as the one, the individual who's been around the church and is receptive. Oh, yes. So receptive. And we rejoice. Yay. Ah, The seed is planted. Whoa, and it's growing. Yay. And they look so good. Look at that plant. Wow, isn't it beautiful? Wow. See what God is doing in their lives. Yes. And God is moving in their lives. And things are happening. But they don't ever quite. They don't quite make it. Why don't they make it? Because down underneath, not too far down, but beneath the surface surface is the same identical thing that's going on in hard-hearted Hannah. (laughs) It's just covered up. Religiously covered up. Now, it's interesting. If you stand in front of a crowd, any crowd, this crowd, any crowd, and say, do you want joy? Well, yes. Who doesn't want joy? Do you want peace? Well, (laughs) Well, sure, good night. You think I'm an idiot? Yes, I want peace. Well, absolutely I want peace. Do you want happiness? Well, good night. For sure I want happiness. Do you want blessings? Well, absolutely. I love blessings. Bring on the blessing. Do you want, hey, uh, do you enjoy guilt? No, I want deliverance from guilt. Yes. Do you want victory in your life? Yes. I'm, I'm tired of defeat. Yes. I don't like some of the things I do. I'd like to have victory. Good. See, any crowd you want to go to, they're all going to respond to that. But get the language of this. I want peace. I want joy. I want deliverance. I want all my enemies to die, especially the ones I don't like. I want, I want. And while there is a 
and acceptance to Jesus, and they will say, oh, God has touched my life. Salvation has come. Hey, I'm, I, I, know what, I know what it is to have the presence of Jesus in my life. They never quite make it. Because there's this, there's this resistance. There's this, see, I, I want God to bless my life because it's my life and I have an agenda. But I haven't come to him and said, hey, I'm giving up my agenda for my life and you bring your agenda to my life and anything you want to change will be all right. No, I'm not going that far. I just want God to bless my life and my agenda. And he isn't going to do that. That isn't going to happen, people. See, I want happiness. Well, sure, I want happiness. But I want happiness in my description of happiness. You know what his description of happiness is? Flip by Jalen singing with a bleeding back. <laughs> well, that's the craziest thing I ever heard of. I know. So see, to have happiness, really happiness, I, I never get happiness in my framework. It always has to be in his framework. So I, somehow I'm going to have to come from, God, I want you to give me happiness, it's, it, which is the way I describe it, to, oh, God, I'm willing to take your peace, your happiness, what you're all about, as you give it. I'm giving up my agenda to take on your agenda. I'm giving up my thought process to take on your thought process. I'm giving, this is an absolute, total, down to it, surrender kind of thing. And shallow, hollow, holly never quite makes that. So you get these constant, you get this constant, well, I was doing well, but I don't know. Things kind of fell apart. And, and you know, but I want to get back on track. And then things fall apart. And, and, and it's the yo-yo thing of in and out, up and down. Have it, don't have it. Got him, don't have him. Because there's this. That's a miserable way to live. And could I tell you, it creates a lot of misery for people around you. <laughs> I don't want to be that way. Dear Jesus, break up the... And let me be real all the way through. Oh, we got to quit. But The third one is this fickle, freckled Frederick. See, Jesus, I want Jesus, but he's just one item among many. And there's an acceptance. I buy into Jesus, but I got a lot of other. And it just, isn't it interesting? And let me just state this. Jesus has to be the singular item of your life. And don't, don't, not that you have, but some people come to me and they question whether this works or not. But Jesus, if Jesus has never become the singular item item of your life you don't know whether it works or not because it never works till that takes place wow Jesus you told since a simple story and yet at the heart of it is the very essence of the gospel of your claim upon our lives. And forgive me tonight, Jesus. Forgive me tonight in the name of Jesus. Forgive me tonight for every time I've received you, but on my terms. I've embraced you, 
but in where I wanted you. I've tried to form you into the answer to the problems I want answered. I've tried to shape you into the form that would fit well with my life. I've conned you. That's what I've done. I've conned you. I've messed with you, God. I've used you. And then I had the nerve. Jesus, forgive me. I had the nerve to look you in the face and say, well, you don't do what you said you'd do. And blamed you for the circumstances of my life when I never really came clean with you. Forgive me. Could tonight, in this service, could all conning be set aside? Could I break with myself? And all my manipulation and all my self-focus. And could I kneel broken, surrendered, no agenda, just you. I have a choice, don't I? I have a choice. I choose you, Jesus, tonight over myself. Hey, altar's open.